Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 165, featuring the first part of a brand new interview series with Mr. Sandy Peterson. This first part of the interview, we focus on Call of Cthulhu, one of uh, Sandy's greatest games and one of the scariest role-playing games of all time. Got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Sandy Peterson. Hi folks, I am here today with Mr. Sandy Peterson. He is the author of Chaosium's Call of Cthulhu RPG, uh, ElfQuest, Ghostbusters. He uh, was a designer at Microprose, did some great stuff for them. He's also a designer on Doom, uh, Doom 2 and Quake. And he's <laughs> then he went to Ensemble Studios, uh, did some good work there. And now he's a partner in a small startup iPhone company named Barking Lizards. How are you doing today, Sandy? Hey, I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I, you know, I just now heard about this uh, company of, called Barking Lizards. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, what kind of projects you've got going on there? Well, we have released a, uh, a kind of an old school console type RPG called Osiris Legends. We have um, some other apps coming up. It's like it's basically your typical small struggling iPhone app company trying to make its way in the uh, in the great ocean of uh, iPhone apps. <laughs> So we, if you, want, if you want more, you have to watch for our Kickstarter video coming out next week or two. <laughs> oh, so it's going to be a Kickstarter project. We're gonna, well, we're gonna we're gonna one of our upcoming uh, projects. We're gonna see if we can Kickstarter. We have it's like Kickstarter is new and alien to me, but we'll see how that works. And a lot of people I know are having a lot of success with the Kickstarter. Uh, Brian Fargo, uh, Wasteland Two. Well, that's what it looks like. So we're I guess I we're gonna dip our feet in it too and and see if a uh, a Cthulhu strategy game would would be any fun. But that's kind of what we're looking at. It sounds like it would (laughs) be a lot of fun to me. (laughs) Well, you have to play the monsters in this one, so you have to like be Cthulhu. So I think that would be attractive to some some section of the population. Well, let's not talk about H.P. Lovecraft. And I know you're a huge huge fan. I'm just wondering, uh, you know, when, when when did you first uh, read a Lovecraft story, and uh, what was it about it that appealed to you so much? Well, um, when I was a kid back in the in the '60s, I always liked monster movies and stuff. When I was and I was I was precocious. I was one of those annoying little kids that read a lot and you know did good in the spelling quizzes, that kind of thing. And my dad had a book called The Dunwich Horror and Other Stories, which is a collection of Lovecraft. Stories and this book was actually a really cheaply put together paperback printed in 1942. The intent being to send to sailors and soldiers fighting like the Nazis and the Japanese, they would have something to entertain themselves with. So I'm not sure how much reading Lovecraft like boosted their morale, but this is the book I had when I was eight. So I read this book and really liked the stories. I'd never read anything like them before, they were so different from regular horror. And then, um, uh, the book vanished, and it was gone for three years. Uh, from and I had no and Lovecraft was really hard to find at the time. You just couldn't. It's very difficult to, to find any Lovecraft stories. When I was twelve, uh, a friend of mine reacquainted himself with me. He'd, he'd been for t- three years. He'd been out of contact, and he said, "Oh, look, here's that book you loaned me three years ago." I go, "Ah!" So I found the book, and then that was my only source for a while of Lovecraft. I wanted to find more. When I turned 14, I got access to the local college library, which they had some of the old um, Arkham House books from the early 50s, which were worth hundreds of dollars at the time, which is tons, but they didn't know it, so it wasn't in the locked book section or anything. So I read those for a while, then they found out that those were valuable, and they locked them so I couldn't get at them anymore. So finally, when I was 17, Ballantine came out with paperbacks of all of Lovecraft stories. So I, so to sum up, because it was hard for me to find Lovecraft and I liked him, I had to go searching around and poking in old libraries and doing the kind of things I guess Lovecraft heroes do, except, you know, without the monsters. That kind of made, hooked me on Lovecraft. It was so difficult for me to get his stories. Every time I found a new story of his in an anthology or something, it was like, oh, new Lovecraft story, it's great. And then, of course, I kept hoping that there'd be a Lovecraft movie, and, of course, all the ones that came out in the 60s and 70s were absolutely terrible. But that's life. So there's a long tale of questing and difficulty. And now he's, like, super accessible. It bemuses me that everyone, that, well, not everyone, but a lot of people know who Cthulhu is. I actually have an uh, acrylic painting of Cthulhu on the wall of my house. Looking at it right now, done by Tom Sullivan. So. Yeah, I was halfway expecting you to say that you found some some of his books in a subterranean vault somewhere with lots of 
<laughs> columns oh, <laughs> and lizard, lizard temples. Uh, library, does that count? I mean, <laughs> well, I could. <laughs> no one, I never saw anyone else in the section I was in. Well, how did you end up as a zoology major? Well, I always really like animals. Maybe that was a side effect of my liking um, monsters. I don't know, or insects particularly. So when I went to college at the local college, I just like zoology was what I wanted to do. I never, I've only, I've used it on occasion. If you've read any of my Lovecraft books or or, think, or the backgrounds I write for the games, there's often little zoological things. There's monsters that have real life cycles taken from the world and stuff. So, I mean, it's, when I was at uh, Micropro Software, we, d we did a, uh, well, not a, we asked all the other designers. There was like 10 of us. We asked them what they had done, studied in college. And um, it was really eclectic. One of them had studied music, one history, one economics. Uh, you know, I'd studied zoology. And there was all these different things. None of them, none of it, none of it was made any sense necessarily towards game design. And what it boiled down to is that, all the designers I knew were interested in a lot of things, and like one of them happened to be the thing we went to college for, but it wasn't necessarily related to our job. And so we just have a wide span of interests, and, and the one that bulged out most was uh, zoology for me, but I could have just as easily gone into history or who knows what, right? So. Yeah, I'm just wondering, one of the criticisms, criticisms I hear a lot about uh, dungeons, dungeon games is, uh, what are these monsters eating? <laughs> You know, way down in these. Do you have any thoughts on that as a, a, a zoologist? To do a seminar on monster ecology trying to explain it. Call of Cthulhu doesn't really have the problem because there's not like a giant mass of monsters feeding on the world trying to have an ecology. They're more of an intrusion into the natural world's ecology, ecology a, a, a harming of it. Um, I would say that in the typical dungeon game, there are way more predators than the uh, system can support, if you know what I mean. I mean, if you go walking around um, the African savanna, there's lions and, and uh, wild dogs and stuff, but they aren't, you know, they're like 10% of the, the biomass of the, of the life there. Of course, of course, a plant eater can be dangerous too. One solution that I came up with for my monster ecology thing was that a lot of these things that are monstrous that harm you might be plant eaters, right? I mean, a Cape buffalo is dangerous. For example, it was my, I assumed that medusas, the D&D medusa had to be a plant eater because anything else would be turned to stone, right? They're vegetarians. It makes sense. The yeah, it does. It's just a, uh, you know, a defensive mechanism. That's if you want to make a producer be in ecology, which may not be the goal. Do you remember the first time you ever played a role-playing game? I assume it was uh, Dungeons, and Dungeons and Dragons, but... 73, Dungeons and Dragons. I sat down, my friend said, there's this cool game that just came out that we just barely heard of. I borrowed a copy from my teacher at college. It was my... my Freshman year at college, I said we go into dungeons. I said dungeons. I was thinking like balls and chains and and uh, you know dark chambers. These no, let's try it. So he made like a primitive dungeon up, and we had characters and we and we played it and it was it was pretty new and different. So I so then of course all of us instantly made dungeons and they were probably terrible by modern standards, but we had a lot of fun. We played that for years and years and it, and it wasn't until nineteen seven that was nineteen seventy three. In 1979, I started trying to put together my own role-playing games, and Call of Cthulhu eventually uh, spawned out of that. Did you naturally gravitate towards a dungeon master role in your group? Yeah, I had to be the dungeon master most of the time. And now that I'm a published author that does games, I have to dungeon master. I have to be the the keeper, so to speak, almost every single time. I still run role-playing games on Saturday nights at my house, and I would say 98 percent of the time it's me stuck rolling. You know being the master so everyone says well you've done it so long i said well yeah so i keep i keep digging the rut deeper and deeper that i'm in you know so do you ever just want to be a player again sometimes i do and uh actually last saturday one of the players uh did run a game where i got to be a player but my player chops are not so great as they used to be because i'm just not i don't think like a player i think like you know, so I'm kind of secretly sympathetic to the bad guys when I play and try to think of ways they could destroy us and kind of leave. It's I'm not necessarily a good team player anymore. I think being dungeon master for so long has sort of ruined me. Yeah, maybe it's the beard too. The beard? The beards make you evil? Is that the idea? No, it's, it's, it makes you a dungeon master. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of my players have beards. Uh, you know. Uh... Well, in 1981, you authored a 
Chaosium's Call of Cthulhu. Yes. Uh, really interesting uh, uh, gameplay mechanics in that, of course, the sanity points, uh, lots of gruesome endings, uh, completely a skill-based system uh, with no levels. Uh, hit points are handled a little differently. So it was quite different than the typical uh, D&D kind of stuff that was out at the time. So can you tell me a little bit about how you uh, came up with all this? Well, uh, what had happened is that a friend of mine, Steve Marsh, had encouraged me to... I'd been working on this game that uh, we kind of called American Gothic, which is a horror-based game. We'd haunt, go to haunted houses and stuff. And I'd done a little bit of work for Chaosium do, uh, because I liked their fantasy role-playing game, RuneQuest. And eventually I found out that they were... I, I, I wrote to Chaosium and said, I really like Lovecraft. I want to do a fantasy supplement for RuneQuest using like Lovecraft's Dream World stories which uh, are probably his least favorite stories, but they have some fun stuff in them. And uh, Chaosium said, nah, we don't want to have a dream, a dream world section. We're going to do a whole, we've got the license to do a whole, uh, call it a whole game based on Lovecraft in the modern era. And, uh, you know, so we're doing that. And I said, wow, I want to be involved. You know, is there anything I do? Can I proofread it? And then they said, the guy we have doing it has, has been kind of slow and, and dilatory. So we're just going to give you the whole project. So they just like dumped it in my lap. Uh, they told me afterwards their logic was I'd never missed a deadline and I was a big Lovecraft fan. And the guys at Chaosium weren't Lovecraft fans. They thought Lovecraft was a terrible author. But, but they were smart enough to know that, someone who, that only someone that loved Lovecraft could do the game. So they gave it to me. So then, you know, one year later, Newlywed Sandy produced the game, uh, sent it into him. Now they actually gave me the game system with the skill-based stuff. That was taken from their system of basic role playing, but the, but everything else, the, the gruesome endings, the, the the description of how you do a campaign. I think I, I figured early on that one of the principles of a Lovecraft story is it's got to be, I mean, cinematic is maybe the wrong way of putting it, but it has to be based on on scenes and big events. So it is kind of cinematic. Because if you read Lovecraft stories, they're kind of there's like a lot of talking and reading letters. Then there's like some huge, terrible thing that happens, and there's talking and reading letters than a huge thing that someone happens. So it's like episodic. So I wanted to get that feel into it. The, uh, the sanity thing came in because I noticed that in Lovecraft stories, people didn't just die. They had all kinds of terrible things happen. And one of the most common things was that they would faint or, or panic or, you know, lose control of themselves for a while or, you know, go permanently insane. And this became really useful because I could use it to make old PCs like become villains Right, because now instead of being a player anymore, you went crazy. Now you're a villain. You're going to be haunting the rest of the party. And and I, I think every keeper has a story about using that on the players. I, I first knew that I was onto something. I, I put in the sanity system. Didn't realize all its ramifications at the time. But I play tested the game. This was in California where I was living. I was going to school, and I said, okay, let's try out my new game. Call it, uh, we called it Dark Worlds. Then we'll try out Dark Worlds, a Call of Cthulhu game. Let's do it. So we're doing the very first scenario in Call of Cthulhu. There's a scenario right in the back of the book that's everyone's first scenario. It's a haunted house. So they're playing in the haunted house, and they find this book that says that has a spell in it that says summon malign thing from beyond the stars. So they go into the basement, and they set up the little pentagram, and they're getting ready to cast the spell. And just before they cast it, like, like half the players say, I'm closing my eyes, I'm looking away, I'm covering my face. They don't want to see it. And at, the, and at that point, I realized, I, I thought, hey, nobody would ever do that in D&D. They always want to be aware of what's going on. In this game, because of the sanity rules, if nothing else, the players are acting like they're, like they're scared, like their characters don't want to see the awful thing that's going on. And I realized I was, I was on to something uh, that was very different from the regular game. And of course, then the other aspect was there's the investigative part of it. It's not so much about fighting. I mean, if you... If you have to fight, then it's bad in Call of Cthulhu, right? Because, I mean, the weakest monster in the game is probably, well, I guess I was going to say a werewolf, maybe a cultist. And a cultist is as strong as you are, right? He's got everything you've got. You know, he can have a machine gun. And uh, so the monsters are really tough, and the investigation becomes the main aspect of it, where you're doing other kinds of interactions. There's no equivalent of a dungeon, you know? I think that because of that, a lot of women who often like horror stories like to play in the game, so when you're going through the conventions and you see people playing Call of Cthulhu, there's always, like, women there as well as men. I mean, maybe that's kind of crass to say, but that meant that you see the D&D table, it's like, it's like all guys, maybe with one bored girlfriend, like, being forced to play. <laughs> Cthulhu, there's, like, active female and the females who are engaged and enjoying it, so. 
No. Yeah, how can you go wrong? Role-playing games and women. <laughs> a combination. Right? And, the you know, it's like, well, horror is like a more adult genre than fantasy. I mean, I love fantasy, but let's face it, fantasy is like a different kind of escapism. Not the horror is not escapism, but you know what I'm talking about. So... Do you have a favorite one of these uh, gruesome endings? Do you have a favorite one? Well, you got to understand that I've been playing uh, Call of Cthulhu for like 30 years. So that I have totaled up a lot of super gruesome endings in my mind. I think one of my favorite ones was a guy that had his face... No, no, I think, I think my favorite ending is where the players had been har harassed by these monsters... That were that were becoming increasingly good imitations of humanity, and they finally decided they were going to test everyone in the group to see if they were human. And they tested one of the players and found out he wasn't. He said, "What do you mean I'm not human?" And I said, "Well, you test is not human." So they went upstairs to his bedroom and found his real self in the closet. And then he wanted to go back and be his real self. I said, "No, you're this guy. You're this alien thing. You know, but you still think like a human because the monsters had finally pulled off a creature so much like a human he didn't know he wasn't human. So he had to keep playing the monster." And then he had to deal with what that was like. Like, because he didn't, he still didn't want the monsters to win, you know. But it was there was like the whole the game broke apart that evening, and they spent the whole night like trying to discuss like what they should do with him. The other players didn't trust him. He said, "No, no, really, it's still me. I'm just you know a hollow shell of a man." So that was a, uh, I think, because of the angst and the and the the, the, the players' shock. That was one of my favorite uh, endings. I mean, tons, tons of endings where everyone dies, right? I mean, that's like, those, those happen fairly often because when I'm called to go to a convention and run a game, everyone expects, you know, to die in Sandy Peterson's Call of Cthulhu Adventure. So I make a lot of them that kind of are aimed that way so they can, you know, kind of pull it off. So in, in fact, my most recent convention, I went to a North Texas role-playing convention. Uh, the players ended the game by flying their ship into the sun. They had a spaceship. And they said enough nuclear bombs on it at the same time. So that was, they were pretty much dead. It was a, it was a futuristic Call of Cthulhu adventure. They went into space and found terrible things. You're credited with the uh, onion skin uh, concept. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what that, what that means and uh, why, why that's effective. Well, the thing is, up until then, I mean, role-playing games weren't really about investigation. Maybe there was some trivial, like you have to find the dungeon, you know, as your investigation. And I knew that Call of Cthulhu had to have investigation be a major part of the game. So I kind of based it off the stories where the, where the characters don't just rush off to the haunted house. Well, I mean, sometimes they do, but usually they, like, do some research. They go to the library. I mean, Call of Cthulhu has got to be one of the few games with a library use skill. And I'm going to put that in because of my searching for Lovecraft in the library when I was a kid. But uh, so the onion skin thing, what that, the idea behind that is, is that you have to... You, if you're going to have a game about research, what I said was, well, well there is, there's several stages of it. So it's like the layers of the onion, as I described it, was first there's the outer thing where you know there's some kind of murders going on. So you, so you peel away the layer of the onion and find out that there's a cult causing the murders. Then you peel away the next and find out the cult is part of a huge master cult over the whole country. Then you peel away that and find out that the cult is being run by a bunch of non-human entities from Pluto. And then you, and you kind of keep going deeper and finding each section, there's a, there, each uh, part of the... Uh, the, the campaign, there's a new discovery that leads to something bigger. You get getting closer and closer to the core. And, and the idea behind that was this way you could have an investigation campaign with really horrible monsters and yet work your way up to and yet have it be a real campaign with sequential th events that, that uh, keep going until you get to the final result. Although my understanding is that while there are campaigns of Call of Cthulhu, I think probably a, a majority of the uh, games are single event They'll, they'll play it for a while, the characters will get killed, then they'll play something else, and then they'll go back to Cthulhu again, play it for a while, and I think that's a fine way for it to be, have it be an episodic thing like that. I don't think it has, I don't think it really suits itself to a long, to a years-long campaign like D&D, you know. Too much character turnover. Yeah, I saw in an earlier interview where someone had asked you, what is it, how do you make a successful horror, horror RPG where the players are actually uh, frightened? And you had said that, well, a lot of the, what, what happens, what goes wrong a lot of the times is that the, uh, I guess the uh, Dungeon Masters, uh, quote, soften the rules of horror. Uh, and I was wondering, you know, what are these uh, rules of horror? <laughs> well, the rules of horror were, uh, that I like most are the ones that are defined by um, M.R. James, the world's greatest ghost story writer. And the first rule is to, that the ghost has to be malign. 
in this case, in Call of Duty, the, the bad guys have to be evil. Okay, I've seen a lot of people even running through where they have like, well, the great race isn't that bad. They can kind of be on our side, or they have a player playing a part deep one, or they'll basically, or I mean, Vampire the Masquerade is the classic example. Okay where the players are actually the vampires. Of course, there's evil vampires and good vampires. Now, I have nothing against Vampire the Master Raid, but it's not necessarily a scary game, right? So the idea is that the monsters, if, even if the Great Race, its sole goal isn't to wipe out humanity, the effects of what they want need to be bad for, the, for people. So you know the monsters are bad. That's the first thing. Once there's a monster that's a good guy, then you're not scared of him anymore. No one's afraid of Casper the Friendly Ghost, you know? So, but everyone's afraid of Sadako. From a Ringu, from a Ringu. So you want it in monsters yeah, That's the first rule. Second rule, uh, you can't use jargon. Um, he was talking now. Mr. James was talking about using like psychic jargon, like auras and stuff, whatever the the, the, the common uh, vibrations, the kind of thing of the day. But in Call of Cthulhu, what you want to do is not use, uh, or in role playing, you don't use technical terms too much. Don't talk about the monsters hit dice. Don't talk about he did eight points of damage. You, you, you say something more like like he takes a bite out of your shoulder. And you take eight points damage if you if you right and so, so it seems like there's physical things happening. The monster, you know, don't say the monster did did seven points of impact on the door. He says the door bulges as it shoves on it. That kind of thing. The final rule that he had was that the player needs to the reader needs to feel like it's taking place somewhere that he could imagine himself to be. So the more it's like the player's world, the better off you are. I think a really good example of this actually is the movie Alien, even though it's on a spaceship, because the, the spaceship in Alien is different from any spaceship we'd ever seen before in science fiction. It, I mean, it looked like a scow. It was like hanging chains and dripping, condensing water, and it was like this, this junk heap of a spaceship. And it seemed, yeah, you know, if we had spaceships, they'd probably be like this. And the people seemed very much like ordinary people, not like you know, Captain Kirk or Luke Skywalker. It was a different kind of feel. So Alien pulled off the, have to be some of the players, the, the viewers can imagine themselves to be really effectively, even though in a weird place. So that's, Call of Cthulhu does that by, you don't have feudal knights and lords and kings. You have people with cars and phones and modern paraphernalia. And, you know, and some of that can actually add to the paranoia when you start turning the, uh, the modern technology against itself. Those are three of the basic rules of horror. Yeah, that's really, really fascinating to me because almost all the role-playing games I've played, it's always about building up this god-like, god-of-war type Superman uh, character. It uh, doesn't lend itself well to horror. I think being vulnerable is an important pack. In fact, an important part of Call of Duty. In fact, I think one of, the, one of the errors that a lot of the other horror role-playing games have made is that they, they have tried, they have reacted fact that you're weak and vulnerable in Call of Cthulhu by trying to make you less vulnerable. So they will give you, you'll be part of a secret government agency, or you're an elite spy, or you're like a super monster fighter or something. And then kind of the, the whole point of a Lovecraft thing is like, it's just us against these awful horrors it kind of goes away. And I think when you realize that you're just, that your character is a school teacher, you know, or, you know, a baseball card collector or a lawyer or a professor, you know, or then suddenly, like, the monsters are way scarier. It's just us against them. I think that's a really effective thing. I mean, if you think about uh, successful horror movies, a lot of them are successful because the main characters aren't super effective tough guys beating the monsters. Or if they are, for example, as in Dog Soldiers or Aliens, where they have the elite soldiers going out there, the elite soldier aspect is only brought in to show how ineffective that is against these things. So, you know, so... And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with part two of my interview with Mr. Sandy Peterson. Have a lot of great stuff coming up. We've got more uh, tabletop games to talk about as well as his uh, computer games work. So a lot of good stuff, so stay tuned for that. As always, I want to thank you if you have donated and supported the show in any way. Uh, that includes uh, sending donations uh, via PayPal at uh, armchairarcade.com, but also spreading the word on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, whatever. Really appreciate it, guys, when you help spread the word about the show. So thank you very much for that. Now, what about that Ale of the Week? So the Ale of the Week is a Blue Moon Harvest Pumpkin Ale. Now, this is part of the seasonal collection from Blue Moon. And I'm pretty sure you've heard of this uh, brewery. They seem to be everywhere these days. They're out of uh, Colorado, Golden, Colorado, to be precise. 
It's another one of these pumpkin ales. This one says that it uh, is crafted with actual pumpkins and flavors of cloves, allspice, and nutmeg uh, with a touch of wheat. So that you know, sounds interesting. As you remember a couple episodes back, I had the horny goat, horny uh, copia pumpkin ale. So let's uh, taste this one and see what it's like. So here I am with the Blue Moon Harvest Pumpkin Ale. And I've been smelling this in there. It does have a nice aroma of pumpkin pie. You know, those uh, pumpkin pie spices that I like so much. Uh, very pleasant smell. Let's give it a taste though. Now taste wise, I'm not tasting the pumpkin. Uh, it's, I guess the uh, the pumpkin comes in comes in with the aftertaste. You know, there's a little bit of pumpkin there, not nearly as strong as I would think, uh, considering the the smell of it. It's uh, actually very lightly flavored. Uh, just a almost tastes like water with a few pumpkin <laughs> pumpkin spices added in. Uh, not a lot of flavor here. Actually, I much prefer the uh, horny copia from the. Um, Horny Goat Company, that was a much better uh, pumpkin ale. It's not bad though, if you like a Blue Moon, um, it definitely tastes like a Blue Moon with some pumpkin pie spice tossed in there. I actually like it better than a regular Blue Moon uh, for what that's worth. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to go with a 1 out of 5 uh, drinking horns on this. I think you can do a little bit better if you're looking for pumpkin ale uh, than this Blue Moon. Uh, on the other hand, it's not bad, and if it's a choice between this and <laughs> something like a Budweiser, uh, you should probably go with this one. All right, let's uh, wrap up with a quotation. And the quotation uh, comes from, of course, H.P. Lovecraft, and it goes something like this. The world is indeed comic, but the joke is on mankind. See you guys next week. Let me put it this way, Mr. Murray. Without being aware of it, your newspapers were very near the truth when they spoke of mysterious invaders from Planet X. Am I going crazy? <laughs>